everyone and welcome to Fast Tracking Scotland's Summit. We are in our second session for the day, which is the launch of the Scottish Public Attitudes to HIV report. Um, just a couple more housekeeping um, things for you if you weren't at the opening plenary. Remember to use the Q&A function to submit questions throughout this session and that's at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. You can also use the chat function um, to drop in some thoughts um, throughout the session um, and make sure you use the all participants and attendees option. If you want to make sure that your name is appearing on Zoom how you would like it to and isn't reflective of the Zoom quiz that you were at at the weekend, then you can hit rename in the participants box. Uh, the Public Attitudes, um, or, and just a final note about our sponsors who have made the Fast Tracking Scotland Summit possible, but have not endorsed, supported or paid speakers, nor have they influenced the content of any of the sessions and specific thanks to Gilead Sciences um, for their support for the summit. Um, so we're, I'm going to introduce you to, to Mark Diffley. Um, he's um, known by people um, around Scotland as a, a, a pollster. Um, he, we've commissioned Mark um, to carry out this um, report um, and polling. He's going to take us through um, the results of this national poll in Scotland and then we're going to have opportunity for question answer um, and the chance for me and Mark to discuss um, some of these results and what should come out of them as some actions um, later on. So I'll hand you over to Mark now. Mark, welcome to the Fast Tracking Scotland Summit. Um, just a reminder to people as well, they can tweet using the hashtag Fast Track Scott. Um, Mark, I'll hand over to you. Mm. Sorry, just had a cup of coffee there at the wrong moment. Thanks very much, Nathan, and um, I'm delighted to um, to be here. Um, and thank you for your introduction. So we've got, I think, about half an hour for this session. So I was going to give a, a kind of a highlight package from the survey, and uh, as Nathan says, then there'll be time for some um, there'll be time for some questions uh, and discussion. Uh, at the end. So I'll try and go for about sort of 10 or 15 minutes, give what I think are the, um, the kind of key numbers in this and um, be interested to hear people's comments, um, people's comments back. So thanks very much. I'll just be um, asking Nathan just to sort of move on with the, with the slides as we go. And just by way of introduction, um, this is indeed the sort of first, what I would call really large scale survey in Scotland and on, on, on awareness to uh, on awareness and attitudes to HIV. We um, had over 2,000 uh, responses uh, to, the, uh, to the survey, um, which we were really keen to make this as um, large a scale of survey as we could to enable us to do some useful disaggregation um, of the data and to look at trends across the, um, the population. The data is pretty much hot off the press. We did the uh, we did the survey at the back end of October, so um, these really are up to date and sort of detailed uh, attitudes um, of people in Scotland to um, to HIV. So we're, we're we're delighted with that. I think the um, the both the scale of the survey and the fact that this. I think the survey will and should have a, um, a legacy. I think it is a robust state of the nation analysis. Um, the questions can be revisited. And indeed, we um, drew some of our questions from, from other surveys, particularly from a 2014 GB wide um, survey, which I'll mention as we, uh, as we go along to draw comparisons. And more recently, a Scottish uh, Health Council uh, citizens panel survey, which was quite small scale, um, but which we also drew uh, some of the questions from in order that we could make those comparisons. So I'm really keen that the survey has some uh, legacy as well, so that we can uh, measure in a robust way how these attitudes and how awareness is changing, um, is changing over time. As I said, this is really a kind of highlight package so the whole data set will be available um, on HIV Scotland's website um, shortly after this event. Thanks very much Nathan. So the survey was uh, broken down into four 
sections. So the first section is about awareness, and we were keen to understand the extent to which um, people in Scotland were aware of issues around HIV, both uh, in terms of um, how the uh, how HIV um, could be contracted, and also um, sort of specific issues um, about people living with HIV. At the start of the, uh, the survey, we asked people to uh, self-assess how they thought their knowledge of HIV was. And we had um, about just over half the population, 54%, saying they had good or very good um, awareness of HIV. They felt that they were up to date with issues. And 36% saying that they self-assessed as average and 10% saying that it was not very good or not at all good. So most of the population at least thought at the, at the get-go of the survey that they had, um, that they had at least average uh, awareness of HIV. And we, we, the, the reason for doing that is that we could then sort of see, well, to what extent was this actually, was this actually true? Um, you may think you may know uh, details about uh, about HIV but to what extent was this actually true when we got into the survey thanks very much Nathan so <clears throat> one of the questions that I wanted to spend a, a little bit of time on was uh, this question of which of the following ways if any do you think HIV can be passed from person to person and I suspect the uh, the order in which um, the, the, these are the answers these are where people said yes it can be uh, it can be spread from person to person or passed from person to person in these ways I suspect the order in which these appear <clears throat> isn't a huge surprise uh, to people on this call but maybe the scale of uh, maybe the scale is and there are a few things that sort of jump out uh, I think here uh, and this question was used in the 2014 GB wide survey. I mean, clearly there are some health warnings with that. That was GB wide. This is Scotland only, and it is from six years ago, but it's useful to have a look at some of the differences. So um, the issue of sort of stand, you know, can HIV be passed by standing on a used needle? 69% uh, um, in our survey said they thought that it could. Only 52% said that in 2014. Um, can it be passed via a blood transfusion in the UK? 52% um, of our sample said that it could, uh, and only 44% said that it could in 2014. So there are some issues, I think, with awareness, and I think we'll come on to uh, some of that a bit later on. The key points, I think, that come up both in this question and across the survey, and are really worth kind of bearing in mind um, in relation to all the questions that we asked, whether it's about awareness or about your own personal attitudes or wider societal attitudes. There are two variables that really stand out here. Uh, age is one. So your attitudes and your awareness are really impacted by age, how old you are. And the other thing is your personal experience. And we asked the question at the beginning of the survey about whether you know or have known in the past anyone with HIV. 13% uh, of the population said yes to that question. That was another reason why we wanted to make the sample so big that we could have a look at that cohort um, differently to the, from the population as a whole. And um, that was really worthwhile because throughout this, uh, throughout the survey, we noticed that people who have had personal experience and knowing someone uh, either now or in the past with HIV is really impactful on their awareness and their attitudes and just by way of an example or two um, with this so if you know so looking at um, age for instance there isn't a linear relationship with age and awareness and in fact those under 35 actually have so, some of the lowest levels of awareness so if you look at the blood transfusion issue for instance so 52 percent of scots as a whole um, think that uh, hiv can be passed from person to person with a blood transfusion that's 61 percent of those under 35 but only 44 percent of those aged 35 to 44 and then it then goes up again but even in the um, but even in the oldest age group at those 65 plus it's only 52 percent so actually when it comes to and i'm just using that as an example um, 
when it comes to some of these awareness issues, actually it's the youngest uh, people in Scotland <coughs> who are the least uh, aware. Now, the issue of your personal experience, and again, using the um, blood transfusion um, example. So <coughs> again, 52% of the population as a whole think that HIV can be passed via a blood transfusion. Uh, that falls to 43% if you know someone now or in the past who has had HIV, um, but is up to 53% uh, amongst those who don't. So there's quite a big, big difference there. And these are the factors that drive awareness and attitudes throughout. Thanks, Nathan. And just to uh, talk very, very briefly, we then asked a series of, we then posed a series of statements uh, to our sample about all of which are true um, and to see whether they thought they were true or false. And again, we see some of the same patterns. So women on HIV cannot pass uh, HIV onto their children. Only 15% uh, said that that was true. Um, that goes up to 27% if you know someone with HIV and down to 13% if you don't. And on the next slide, uh, there is a pill uh, you can take <clears throat> that prevents HIV infection. 17% uh, said that's true. That goes up to 28% if you know someone with HIV. Um, and 53% said that was false. Um, on the next uh, statement, someone taking HIV treatment can have a near normal life expectancy. 88% <clears throat> that was true, but that goes up to virtually everyone, goes up to 96% um, if you uh, of the cohort that knows someone with HIV. And <clears throat> someone taking treatment who has an undetectable amount of HIV virus in their body cannot pass on HIV to their sexual partners. And only 19% uh, thought that was true. Uh, that goes up to 37, uh, to 32 percent, sorry, so about a third of the uh, population who know someone with HIV. So these are clear patterns around, uh, around awareness. The second part of the survey focused on uh, uh, personal attitudes. So what would you do as an individual in certain circumstances? And again, we find some really interesting um, some really interesting data here. So around seven in 10, seven in 10, 71 uh, percent um, agree with the statement that they would be comfortable if my GP offered me an HIV test. Now there are some more linear age relationships here. So that goes up to 83 percent amongst those uh, aged 35 to 44 and uh, falls to 51 percent amongst the oldest cohort, so those aged uh, 65 plus. Uh, what's interesting as well with this is that although we need to be slightly careful on comparing too strongly with the Citizens Panel survey, um, it, it is clear um, that this hasn't, you know, this, there hasn't been a huge amount of progress and it's 84% um, on the Citizens Panel agreed with this statement. So. Um, there's, there's, there's a bit of work, I think, to be done um, with that. We asked as well about whether you'd be comfortable if your child had a classmate who's living with HIV. 59% um, agreed with that. 66% um, of those who, with children at school, agreed, um, agreed with that statement. So it is higher amongst people who have children. Um, and if you know someone with uh, HIV, that's 70%. And if you don't know uh, anyone with HIV, it falls to 56%. So you can see the same patterns emerging through the survey. Um, when asked if you'd be comfortable starting a relationship with someone who's living with HIV, um, we found that uh, only 23% agree with that statement. It goes up to 35% if you know someone um, living with the condition. And there is a very strong age, uh, linear age relationship here. So amongst those under 35, 33% um, agree with this, but only 12% of those aged uh, 65 and over. And finally, in this section, um, levels of comfort kissing someone who is HIV uh, positive 
we found 27% agreed with this statement. So out, you know, those disagreeing uh, outnumbered those who were agreeing. Again, there are some um, age dynamics here. So around the third of the, young, the youngest um, age group agree with this, but down to 16%. Um, of those aged 65 plus. And yet again, if you know someone with HIV, unsurprisingly, that goes up to 45%. So again, knowing someone with HIV is a real a barometer of your attitudes. We asked a few questions on broader societal attitudes and uh, government activity. So what government spends and what government, um, how, how to the extent to which government is committed to um, to HIV issues. Um, and, and here we asked a question around, well, we posed a statement that there is too much time, money and resources invested in HIV uh, compared to other health problems such as heart disease uh, or uh, cancer. Most people, 54%, so just over half, um, agree um, with that um, and, uh, sorry, disagree with that. And only 7% of the population actually do agree with that statement, forced to two percent actually amongst the the youngest cohort, those aged under thirty five. And I think what we what we see here is that although, as I mentioned earlier, um, awareness of HIV issues is not as high as you could argue it, it could and probably should be amongst the the, the youngest cohort uh, in the population. Um, there is a much more linear relationship. Among, with with attitudes to age, so the youngest um, the, the the youngest strata of of um, people in Scotland do tend to have more kind of in inverted commas tolerant attitudes uh, around HIV. So uh, only two percent that they're thinking that uh, too much time, money, and resources uh, is invested. When we ask whether it's right that that, that government spends money. Uh, spends public money on trying to prevent long-term health conditions like HIV. 88% agree um, with that statement. 92% uh, amongst uh, the youngest, uh, un those under aged under 35. What's really interesting here is that, that uh, I mean, rather um, interestingly, I think that falls to 78% amongst those aged 65 plus. And actually, if we break down the agreement statement, so to those who strongly agree, 61% um, of um, th those aged under 35 strongly agree with that uh, statement, uh, that it's right that government spends money on trying to prevent long-term health conditions like HIV. And that falls to 37% of those aged 65 plus. So some real age uh, differences here. And then uh, finally, um, the question that, do you, do you agree with the, the, that Scotland is broadly a tolerant and welcoming place for those with HIV? And I think I was sort of quite surprised at this in some ways. I, I mean, it, you know, 45% do agree. There are large numbers of don't knows, which I guess reflects people not having thought really particularly much about this issue. Um, but actually there are substantial numbers of people, you know, around 30% who either are on the fence on this or who disagree. And there are, there, there, this really isn't a matter of um, age or knowing someone that there are no differences here in, in the kind of subpopulation. So um, that's an issue I think we should maybe pick up in the Q&A as well. The final part of the survey looked at issues of HIV in the workplace. Um, and there are three, three questions here that I think I would like to highlight. Um, the first is around whether you feel comfortable working with a colleague who had HIV. And again, this was asked in the 2014 survey and it's clear when we um, compare the 2014 survey to now that there has been some real progress made both in this question and on other issues around HIV in the workplace. So 79% of our sample said that they would, they agree they would feel comfortable. That was 67% six years ago. So some real progress there and only 5% disagreeing with that. Again, if you know someone with uh, HIV or have in the past known someone with HIV, um, that 79% goes up to 88%, which I think is um, 
again, really interesting about the kind of the advocacy part uh, of this. Uh, and again, there's an age, uh, there is an age uh, factor here as well. Um, it's 89% agreeing with that statement, if you're aged under 35. Now, other people uh, with HIV face discrimination at work. So, I mean, despite that uh, comfort with, um, you know, with people feeling comfortable working, um, uh, working with someone with, with HIV, and there are still around half of us who think that uh, people do people with HIV do face uh, discrimination at work, which I think is um, really quite an interesting uh, quite an interesting finding. Um, again, uh, and you'll, you'll 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 probably predict what I'm going to say here. If you know someone with uh, HIV, you're much likely you're much more likely to think that they face discrimination at work. So that goes up to nearly two thirds, goes up to sixty three percent amongst our cohort who knows someone with HIV. And then finally, for me, uh, just to wrap up, the issue of which I think is a fascinating question: the issue of whether your employer should tell you if one of your work colleagues has HIV. When this was asked in twenty fourteen, actually thirty eight percent of people. This of course is across. Um, uh, Britain rather than just in Scotland, but 38% of people thought that their employer should tell them if uh, someone in the workforce had um, HIV. That's now fallen to 17%. So some real, um, really important progress, I think, there. Okay, so I think for me, if I'm going to kind of summarise these findings, I think there's some real heartening findings around attitudes and shifts in attitudes, which I've tried to highlight through this. Um, it, it, but, I, but I think if I'm honest, um, some of the issues around awareness still present some significant challenges. What's really interesting in the data throughout, which you'll have heard me say, is if you want to understand attitudes, you need to look at how old someone is and whether they know whether or not they know someone with HIV. These are the two big predictors of both your awareness of the issues and your personal and wider attitudes. So I think I'll hand back to Nathan there, but I think that it, the, the survey data really does highlight some um, real positives, but some issues that I think uh, Nathan and colleagues will be wanting to pick up. Nathan. Thanks, Mark. And I think um, some of the points that you you raised in the in the summary there at the end, you know, around um, how we address the misunderstanding and, and lack of awareness, is you know this this survey has really driven our HIV Scotland's Generation Zero campaign, looking at how we get people talking about the myths and the misunderstandings and try and educate people. Um, you mentioned educating the the youngest Scots, and I think that's key. Um, and we banged the drum a bit about getting teachers to teach HIV in the modern day reality. Um, and, and we've shifted away from that slightly in that we um, HIV Scotland partnered with Young Scott, um, who are an information charity for young people, and really trying to get across those key messages in a different um, format rather than just um, in schools. And some of those longer term attitudinal issues, I think, are something that um, campaigns like Generation Zero, like Fast Track Cities are hopefully going to, to be um, to, to help with. I think the, the final point that you made, the how can it be accelerated, um, is a key question to, to people that are that are here at the, the Fast Tracking Scotland Summit. You know, we, we Fast Track Cities have committed to ending stigma and discrimination by 2030. So that means fast tracking and accelerating that response rather than just continuing the way that the way that we're going. We've got a question, um, I, and I know you've just you've just answered that in, in the in the Q and A there, Mark from from Luke, who's asked if there were significant differences um, across social class um, markers, and, and you've just stated there that it's not a significant predictor of a. No, I, th I, yeah, I think it's really important to point out that the absence of other drivers of either awareness or attitudes is quite interesting. Mm. These, th these factors are driven, as, I've, as I said, I think, throughout by your age and by um, uh, your kind of personal experience. Yeah. 
there's a couple of questions come in. Um, Chantal has asked, even though younger people had lower knowledge, they did seem to be more open-minded and less stigmatizing. Yeah. Um, would you say that um, potentially anti-stigma and discrimination messages need to be targeted at older adults? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, we, we, when we chatted about this, I was using the sort of the analogy of my son who's 14. Um, and when I was 14, sort of late 80s, giving my age away, sort of late 80s, very late 80s, fortunately. But, uh, you know, I knew loads about HIV. We were learning about it in school. Um, you know, I saw all the adverts and so forth that, you know, were, that were around at times a real, really kind of highly salient issue. And that really isn't the case now. My son knows, you know, next to nothing about it. It doesn't come up in school, doesn't come up in, in, in chat or anything with his, with his friends or whatever. So there is, um, and I think that probably just explains it was, kind of point, it was a point in time when I compare myself to, uh, to him sort of 35 years, uh, 35 years ago, or whatever, 30 years ago. So uh, there, there was a real sort of point in time. Um, but the attitudes are, yeah, I, you know, clearly the challenging cohort as far as attitudes are concerned are older people, mm. absolutely undoubted. It is a trend throughout the survey data. And so yes, to answer the question, I would, you know, the, the, the attitudinal stuff does not does, does not need, need to be aimed at young people. There is no correlation between knowing a great deal about the issue and, it, in other words, knowing a, a lot about it and whether your attitudes are, as you, the questioner said there, tolerant and, and, and liberal. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the attitudinal stuff needs to be aimed at, um, I guess, people of my age and, and above, really. Uh, the next question came in from, from Christian says, apart from age and personal experience with HIV, um, is, is there any notable, notable differences um, regarding sexuality of respondents or any other um, demographic information? No, the, 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 I mean, there really isn't. You may find in one or two of the questions, I mean, I've done, as you would expect, really deeply into this data. You know, as with any survey, you get differences that are quite small, um, which are kind of insignificant. But when we look at this, the, the trend across the questions and we look at significant um, differences, there aren't. I mean, there, there, there aren't really any differences between whether you live in a city or whether you live in an urban area, uh, in, in a rural area, rather. There aren't any differences like uh, around social class of, of any significance, as I said to Luke um, earlier. Um, and so, I, I, no, I'm... You know, it, 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 what's helpful with that, I think, is that the data is very clear, which I think is, is good and helpful. And therefore, the, you know, what I think are what needs to be recommended from, from this and what you, Nathan, and colleagues and, you know, others um, who are, you know, active in this area need to do is pretty clear. It is pretty clear. There's not a mixed picture here. This is, you know, what you need to do, I think, is how you do it is not a question. I think what you need to do, how you need to target um, is really quite clear from the survey. And I think there's a real advocacy piece in here as well. You know, if you know someone, I mean, it's not that surprising. Right. But it's so stark in the data, that, you know, you, you know, if you know someone either now or in the past who has had HIV, then your awareness and your attitudes to the issue are significantly different. So having adults, having people who can speak about this with experience, I mean, you'll know all this anyway, but you now have the kind of data to back that up and the, and the extent to which that's important is now absolutely clear in the data. And I think there's a real, um, you know, there's a real indication from good, clear data that, that that's, that's going to be really important. Yeah, and I think on that point, Mark, you know, this, this report is going to be made um, available through um, HIV Scotland's website shortly after um today's sessions and and really it, it's an it's an open access piece if there are colleagues across scotland and other third sector organizations or, or beyond that this data will be useful to then we want people to to use it and and, and use it for that advocacy and that those camp campaigns because um this isn't you know about about any one organization this is a, we, we've done a great 
um, and you've done a great piece of work, Mark, on getting this this data pulled together from the largest you know survey on these issues in, in Scotland, specifically Scotland data. Often Scotland is is a subset of a UK um, poll or, or or research. It's yeah. Easy. You know, under a hundred people usually when yeah, you compare yeah, yeah. it in in UK polls. So to, for us to have this data of over two thousand people in Scotland is is really important. Yeah, and while um, uh, you know, um, I'm making these comparisons with 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 data from sort of six, a it's from six years ago and b it's not comparing light with light because it's a GB wide survey. You know, the, the 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 I think what you would want to achieve here, taking a longer view is that you will build up a data set over time from good, big, robust surveys in Scotland to enable you to say, well, this is how the picture looks in Scotland just now, but compares to Scotland um, from two years ago or three years ago, or whatever, rather than having to go back to, to, to the longer, you know, more historical surveys, which, which aren't after the same sample as well. So, you know, I, I did want to make the point about the legacy, because I think that's, you know, I don't think we should just look at this as a point in time. But rather as something that you know you can take as the, the sort of start of building a, a more robust picture as to as to how we're looking at this issue in this country yeah and i think that's a, a note to to funders as well if there are any funders um <laughs> watching either live or, or on the replay that you know from a hiv scotland point of view doing this on a on an annual or, or or every two years to try and get that longitudinal data to show how public attitudes are, are shifting um i think could be would be really useful and it, that yeah, and the other, yeah I, absolutely and i think the other point i would make is that while i've presented some of the kind of key findings um there is a data set attached to this you know for those who want to you know actually dig into the data themselves to find interesting things to find interesting patterns you know, i really have just sort of scratched the surface here there are there are a lot of numbers that lie beyond this and a lot of other tests that can be done on on the data to understand patterns i'm absolutely um able and you know keen to pick up any any kind of further uh, analysis things that people want done on this if they want to contact me through um, through you uh, after this to sort of begin to the data a bit more more than happy to do that for my team. so we've got we've got a couple more questions we're, we're letting this run on slightly longer um so we've got 10 minutes left um if anyone um, has any other questions then get them in the q a function uh, someone has asked how can we ensure that the data or findings that we have are not related to generalized values or attitudes um, as opposed to HIV specific issues? Well, I mean, I think it's a really good, I think that's a really good question. The, um, the and, and well, the, I suppose the easiest way of doing that would be to um, compare how these attitudes differ from, I don't know, if you looked at the um, Scottish Health Survey, for instance, there's attitudinal questions in there. I mean, I, I think it's a valid question. And I think, you know, the, the survey was about HIV. It was clear from the start when we introduced the survey to respondents that it's about HIV. And so, and the questions were very much tailored to what are your experiences of, awareness of, and attitudes to um, HIV. The, 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 the um, we were talking about this earlier, Nathan, but the, 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 the numbers that sort of jumped out at me were things like, you know, your, your attitude to, you know, whether it's right for government to invest so much money in, um, in you know, finding, uh, you know, in, in doing research and funding uh, programmes, you know, for health issues, you know, including HIV or such as HIV, you kind of think, well, so what would the answers to that be if you didn't have the such as HIV um, on the end of them? And if you look at some of those questions and, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it kind of feeds more broadly into my the point I was making about age, right? You have got, you know, only about sort of 60% of those age 65 who think it's a good idea for, for government to spend uh, money or commit resources to health conditions such as HIV. You, that's the co that's the cohort that you would think should actually be most um, you know self interested in government finding cures for or you know funding research into long term health conditions. So if you didn't have such as HIV at the end of that, you know what would that 
the uh, over 65 population have answered. I suspect it would have been a lot higher, right? If you didn't have such as HIV at the end of that. And, and I say that because when we look at some of the other attitudinal stuff on uh, HIV, it age is also a, it is also a really key determinant. So, but I think you know I think it's a, um, I, I think it's a it's a really good question, and I would be looking for you know other evidence from other survey data that might help explain uh, some of that. Um, Fraser's asked in the world of fake news, do we? know who people in Scotland might listen to or trust um, or believe to have their views or knowledge challenged? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I, I mean, about HIV, I can't answer that question because we didn't have it. I mean, just to give a heads up, and it's completely unrelated to this discussion, we've got a piece of, um, we've got a survey coming out tomorrow, a very short survey, but certainly nonetheless, about um, COVID vaccination and about who people, the, the kind of well-known people that should be, um, you know, put up front to uh, try and persuade people that taking the vaccination is a, a good thing. And so while I, while I won't give away who th uh, that is, it, it, there's some quite interesting findings there so people do think that um i think the um but i think as far as hiv is concerned well the people who clearly will have um the biggest impact on changing attitudes are those who have some experience in this regard either personally who, who are living with hiv or who know someone who has and again the, the, there's a lot of rich data in here so in, and, and i think as i said earlier that advocacy in that regard is going to be key i think in changing attitudes and raising awareness yeah. um the the final question unless there are any other questions that come in during um this time um so jimmy's asked um and i think this is probably a question that i can answer um what are the next steps regarding the outcomes of this survey and how will the data be used um, and for what going forward and i think um, we've already used this data to try and shape um, not only the content of this conference, but the content of our um, messaging um, around World AIDS Day, our Generation Zero campaign and what's to come forward from, from that. Um, I think that ultimately this data is for use by the sector. Um, it will be available um, on our website so it can be used to shape your own um, campaigns, advocacy. Um, and that's really, I, I think, a, an important part of this is that it shouldn't just be data that HIV Scotland have or, or Mark has. It needs to be um, much more um, open access, so, so it will be, um, and it will be there for people to, to use the data how they, they want to if it's about shaping a particular campaign. Um, I think there are some useful um, data about urban and rural comparisons, which could be useful um, for some, some campaigns as well. So the data is there to be, to be used. Come and have a conversation with us if it's something that we can do um, in partnership, because I think that would be really useful. I think, as you said, Mark, there's even more analysis that, that could be done. So if that's a case of, of funding some more analysis of, of, of the data in even um, more in-depth in ways, then, then, then let's do that. Um, it, it's definitely, you know, this survey is not an outcome in itself. That's a, this is an output. The outcomes are what we as a sector are now going to go and do about it. Um, we, we've got this data now as a robust Scottish data set um, and the outcomes very much have to be what comes what comes next. And, and we can all play our play our part in that. And it shouldn't just just be one organisation that, that does that. Um, Joyce Ann has her hand up, so I'm going to um, invite her in um, to ask her question if she, she can unmute herself now. Um, Joyce Ann, if you, you want to ask a question. Yeah, I want to ask a question. <clears throat> I feel to, to tackle the issue about stigma for a start, there are two options here. If we could have somebody in the job center, I'm talking from experience, I'm HIV positive and the experience I've had since I started working in Aberdeen, I feel if there was somebody in the job center 
who specifically dealt with disability people, including somebody with HIV. And I was quite happy to get that support up to my place of work. This would stop information coming through the back door with malice on it. I was working at the pub and I felt if that is in place, it would really help me so much. And second, I feel with the COVID information being put out, out there for the employers, the, the HIV should also be put hand to hand, a guidebook also to the employers. This is the time we can put out to the employer. So we have two options. If I, if I, if I tell my employer I'm HIV, or at the same time, the employer has a handbook about the, um, about the HIV that, you know, we are normal people, we can work. There's nothing to it. That would really help. Mm. And that would be the kickstart of the stigma. I, I, I think but, you're right, Joyce Ann. And it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I, I promised to people um, listening and watching that I didn't, um, I didn't pay Joyce Ann to ask that question or, or that um, pose that point. But actually HIV Scotland has just just um, received funding from um, from an organization to do some of that work around one casework for people who might be discriminated in the workplace but also to create those resources that you've you've mentioned Joyce Ann, around employers and employees and what people can expect um, from or should expect from employers and what their legal obligations are but also for employers is what what can should they expect? What do they need to do to make sure that they're not stigmatizing, that they are a welcoming employer? And I think some of the data that we've got from, from this survey is going to allow us to, to come with an evidence base for why that is. Often working with employers can be quite um, challenging because you don't want to unintentionally um, disclose someone's status because you're starting to work with employers. But I think some of the data that we've got from, from here is going to be the impetus to allow us um, to do that. So thank you very much, Joyce, and um, for raising that point. I think it's it's really vital to make sure we're not just working with employers, not just doing a, a general public campaign, but we're we're actually working where people living with HIV are to ensure that we get um, to get these messages across. So thanks very much, Joyce, and for um, being that final um, question there that we've got time for today um, and and thanks to you mark for for all your you and your team's work for getting this um pulled together so quickly so that we could launch it not just for world aids day but more more detail today um yeah. if you've got any questions um that come up after this like i say the report will be made available um on our on our website but head to twitter um hashtag is fast track scott if you want to engage with mark on some other questions i'm sure he will um be happy to answer questions through twitter or by email um, our next session starts in 15 minutes with an in conversation uh, with peter Kriken. so please do join us for that if you're interested in safe drug consumption facilities um, and obviously there are so many more sessions um, today and over the next three days so thanks again mark thanks for everyone that's been watching this session it will go online as well once the recording is processed and um, to catch up but we'll see you all again soon thank you for joining us goodbye